Hi, and welcome to History Through Fiction, the podcast. I'm your host, Colin Mustful, and today I am thrilled to be joined by Candace Simar, author of the novel Sister Lumberjack. Candace, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for inviting me. Could you start by just giving us a brief synopsis of your novel, Sister Lumberjack? Um, Sister Lumberjack is set in 1892 and 93. It has three points of view on a widow who's stuck with grief and a mortgage, a young immigrant who has a problem with bottle fever, and a very unusual Benedictine nun who sells hospital tickets to loggers. These three personalities meet at Stark Weather Timber, a haywire logging camp where everything goes wrong. And because their lives intersect, each of them takes a different direction. I'm curious to know more about how you came up with these characters, um, if they're based on real people or just your imagination. Like what came first for you, um, the history or the characters? I would say that it's always the research that drives my fiction. Um, I have written a series of books called the Abercrombie Trail series. And actually, Sister Lumberjack is book five in that series. Um, Solve was a minor character in book one, Abercrombie Trail. And she was such a great character that she kept trying to take over. And all through the book, I fought her back because she was actually stronger than my protagonist, which is not a good thing if you're writing fiction. Um, she never shows up in any of the other books because I didn't want to fight with her. But now in her widowhood, she is able to take center stage and be the main character in this book. Um, I also had a Danish grandfather who as a young man worked in the logging camps. And I learned from him that um, many immigrants worked in the logging camps in the winter. And then in the summer, they worked on the Bonanza farms in the Red River Valley. So it was year round employment for these laborers that were trying to get started in America. So that was very um, much my incentive to write about the logging camps. And then I discovered in my research, um, the Benedictine health system. And we've all seen the hospitals throughout the state. Um, if they have a saint in front of the name, chances are they're a Benedictine hospital. But these hospitals were built by the Sisters of St. Joseph in St. Joseph, Minnesota, and also in Duluth. Um, because the loggers were injured so often and there was an absolutely no health care for the loggers. And so they devised this program where a nun went around to the camps in the winter walking, snowshoes, catching rides where she could, selling little hospital tickets for $1. And any logger that owned a hospital ticket received free health care if he became sick. Very early insurance program. And I just thought it was so interesting that I included that in my story. So you, for those who don't know, you and I are both Minnesotans. Right. Um, you mentioned this about your, was it great, your grandfather, great grandfather was, was in the lumber industry. How far back does, does your family history go in this region? Um, well, my Abercrombie Trail series is based on one great grandfather who came to Minnesota um, at the very end of the Civil War and drove the stagecoach to Fort Abercrombie. But my grandfather, um, actually came as an immigrant at the age of 19. He came with 10 cents and no English language and got his start in America that way. And that would have been in 1890, I believe. Wow. Yes. And what are Bonanza Farms? I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with those. Oh, I should have explained that. Bonanza Farms were corporate farms in the Red River Valley. And many of you have probably seen the photographs of 
many, many horse teams pulling side by side down a big prairie field. Um, those were the corporate farms. Um, there was a, a railroad induced recession and the railroad paid off its debts by giving investors large tracts of land in the Red River Valley, um, North Dakota and Minnesota on the western border of Minnesota. And so these um, wealthy people in England or New Jersey or wherever they were from um, didn't want to be on the farm, didn't care about farming, but they would hire workers to do all the work. And they provided millions of bushels of wheat that were shipped to the rolling mills in Minneapolis and fed America and many people across the world. Wow. Can you um, talk now a little more about uh, the, well, the lumber industry, because that's what your, your book involves. Um, I'm curious to know what kind of research you did to learn about the daily lives of lumberjacks and maybe what you, what you came across. What did you learn that really surprised you about uh, that type of life? It was big money back then to be able to work in a logging camp. And I discovered that one of the reasons it paid well, for one thing, um, a man could make maybe a dollar eighty a day, but he also got room and board. And back in the day, um, if you were a laborer and had to pay for a room and food, there wasn't much left. But if you could work on either Bonanza Farm or a logging camp, room and board was included along with the top wages. So it was really a great job if you could live through it. It was so dangerous. Um, trees would fall, axes would slip. Um, there was a, one camp where 80 people died of smallpox one winter, you know, close quarters. Um, accidents, injuries, a lot could go wrong. And but it was worth the risk. To my grandfather, he thought it was a great job. It allowed him to get started. And that's my family story with it. I'm also married to a forester. Okay. And so we've visited a lot of museums and um, historical sites through our marriage. And he has a whole library of logging books, textbooks and information and I, delved heavily into those books. Did you ever get to talk to your grandfather about his past or did that never come up when you, you know, when he was still alive? He died when I was four. Okay. So I remember him vividly. He lived upstairs on our farm. Um, but my sister remembers and she has told me and my parents also told me about it. I was in Bemidji a couple days ago, and on Lake Bemidji, there's Paul Bunyan and Babe yes. the Blue Ox, and I guess I never really considered the origins. You know, he's a lumberjack. He's a lumberjack. And these men were all housed together, almost like cattle, 120 men in one bunkhouse, three-tiered bunks with two men to a bunk. And there wasn't anything to do, and so at night they would tell tall tales to entertain each other which I thought was very interesting. Yeah. So you said this is the fifth novel in your series, the Abercrombie Trail series. Can you tell us more about the, the other books you've written in this series? Um, well, my college age kids were coming home one 4th of July. My oldest daughter had just gotten married and I had discovered about this great grandfather who drove the stagecoach right at the end of the Civil War. And I had planned this hallmark moment. I was going to gather them around the table on the 4th of July and say, kids, your great, great grandfather drove the stagecoach right after the Great Sioux Uprising. And they were going to look with, at me with loving admiration and be grateful that I told them this bit of family history. Instead, they didn't care a thing about their great, great grandfather or 
Minnesota history. And our son said, well, what's the Sioux uprising? And I was horrified that my Minnesota born and educated kids knew little to nothing about that part of our history. And so our son, who knew a lot then, he was about 20, I think, he said, well, mom, if you care, why don't you write a book? And so I said I would, and then I had to do it because I said I'd do it. And then I had to start the whole process of learning how to write novels and how to go about it. And it's been a real adventure for me. A lot of fun. Yeah. Well, I read in your bio that you call your books painless history lessons. Yeah. Uh, what, what do you mean by that exactly? Well, I love history. I've been kind of a history nerd all my life. Um, I've never met a museum I didn't love. But um, my kids are good examples of that. At the time, they had no interest at all in the history classes they had taken. And I determined to write a captivating story wrapped around the real history as I studied it and kind of entice non-history lovers into my book and they would learn it just seamlessly and at the end of the book they would all of a sudden realize that they had learned something and I get a lot of feedback from readers my um, first book came out in 2009 I still get um, correspondence on that book and people say that to me that they never cared about history, it was dry facts, it meant nothing to them. But when they stop to consider the people that lived through those times, all of a sudden it's interesting. And they are now visiting the museums and the historical sites, which makes me very happy. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, we really bring history to life for people. Um, I want to ask you for a second, we've been talking about logging, but um, you, you mentioned this insurance program and these tickets. Um, so what about hospitals across, you know, in healthcare? What was that like at that time in Northern Minnesota? Well, Sister Lumberjack takes place in 1892 and 93. Um, there was basically no healthcare at all outside of the um, hospitals in the Twin Cities. The Benedictines had built a hospital in St. Cloud, and there was a new hospital in Duluth. But you have to remember the um, travel situations back then. There were 30,000 loggers in the woods of northern Minnesota that year. And they harvested about a billion board feet of wood. And I, don't know, I don't know how much that is, but it sounds like a lot. It built a lot of cities across the Midwest. And they shipped lumber to Canada, up the Red River, and they down the Mississippi. Um, Minnesota wood built whole cities at the time. Um, so because there was no health care, if a, if a logger was injured, they would bring him in and lay him on the cook shack floor in a corner. And the cook would tend to him if he had time. And what can a cook do? You know, he knew nothing about medicine. So it was a, a no workman's comp at all. So if a logger was hurt on the job and had to go home, he had to find his own way home. If he could do it, um, it, it was not good. I, I bet. And that's, yeah. I suppose, added to the, the dangers of the job. Right. And so um, with this hospital ticket system, um, a nun who was most unusual, she was six feet tall and a giant of a woman um, who wasn't afraid of anything, she would snowshoe between the camps and sell these tickets to young men who thought they were invincible and would never get hurt. And they cost a dollar at the beginning and that was a lot of money to um, the loggers. But she had to convince them to buy these tickets. And then as they saw men get hurt and get hospital care free, 
and most people stayed in the hospital at least a month, um, they realized what a good deal it was. And so then it became easier and easier to sell these tickets. And they actually kept selling these tickets until workman's comp laws went into existence in the 1920s. It was wow. very interesting. They would, um, any money left over from paying for health care was put into a fund that built more hospitals in Grand Rapids, um, Park Rapids, Crookston, um, all the way across um, northern Minnesota. Mm -hmm. Well, you and I both write about somewhat similar time period, and you know, you've already referred to the Sioux Uprising or the U.S. Dakota War, and now talking about harvesting the timber does make me curious about the native history of the state, and it even makes me think all the way back to 1837 with the what was called the White Pine Treaty, because the Dakota and Ojibwe seeded land that would be used for for timber resources. Do you confront any of those issues in in this novel? I, I mean, I know you do in some of your other novels. Do you in this one? Um, yes, I discovered some very unscrupulous tactics going on in the logging industry. For one thing, um, just with the loggers, the timber barons. Um, would buy these huge tracts of land for little or nothing and cut off all the trees and sell them. And even though they paid their men well, and it was expensive to harvest the, the pines, they made a killing on it. They made huge amounts of money. But everyone thought that the white pine were endless and would never be gone but they finally came to the end of it. And so they wanted more land to cut. And it was a very wasteful process. Um, they needed um, trees that were so far, I think it was, I'm not gonna say it right now. Was it 124 inches, I think? Um, they only wanted a certain length because that worked for the sawmills. So anything below that level was just left as flag in the woods. It was very wasteful. But when they ran through the all the land that they could get legally, um, it was illegal for the timber barons or the timber companies to purchase land from the Indians to log. But it was not illegal for an individual to do it. So some of these unscrupulous companies provided a few bottles of liquor and $10 to a trusted employee. And many of the loggers um, had serious drinking problems. So the, these individuals would approach a Native American and trade a few bottles of whiskey and maybe $10, $15 for beautiful tracts of land that would then make this um, company just hugely wealthy, um, very unscrupulous. Yeah. Um, so yes, it, it was not good. Um, I did discover that a lot of the Ojibwa, of course, the Sioux were um, evicted from the state after the U.S. Dakota War. Um, but the Ojibwa um, would come in and work at the camp if they wanted something different, wanted a warm place to stay and some good food but they usually didn't stay. They didn't care about the money. Mm -hmm. And so they'd come and work a few days and then just disappear. Um, but they loved to do the river pig work where they would ride the logs down the river in the spring. Um, we've all seen old movies where the loggers are on top of these rolling logs in the roaring water and they'd herd the logs down to the sawmills. And the Ojibwa really liked to do that. Um, it tested their um, athletic prowess, and they just thought it was fun. So many Ojibwa worked on those river pig crews. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's all very interesting, and you know, I'm glad you're able to um, expose some of that and bring some of that out. You know, we we it, it wasn't that long ago, and we kind of forget 
where all this came from, you know, even in Minneapolis and St. Paul, it was a big area, you know, logs coming down and, and hopefully we've, we've learned some lessons from there, from then, but I, I'm glad you're able to share that, that history in your novel. You know, Jody Picol says to write what you're afraid of. And so the themes in my book, I write about widowhood and starting over when you're too old to do it. Um, that kind of scares me. I'm happily married, but I do fear being a widow. Um, it also deals with addictions. I know a lot of people, family members who have struggled with alcohol and addictions, and also the health care. I was a nurse all my life, so that interests me. So I bring my three things that I was interested in into um, this book. It was a very ambitious book to write, and it took me many years. Um, I had it placed with a bigger publisher, and then it was supposed to come out um, the fall of 22. And I got a call in August that the company was going out of business after COVID. Oh, no. So then I had to start over again and um, ended up going back to North Star Press, a little family-run business um, that I had used before. And um, so that put it back. So it's it's a long time coming out. but yeah. And it's a longer book, um, 425 pages, I believe. Um, but it has the three points of view, and it's it was very satisfying to get get it all together. Right? Well, what was what was the editing process then like for you uh, from first draft to final draft, getting all those stories together? and figuring out just where the narrative was within all that history that you're sharing? It was a massive job. Um, if I'd have known how hard it would be, I probably wouldn't have done it. But I naively went into it thinking it wasn't going to be so bad. Um, I had written it actually from uh, with two points of view, both women. And I went to a writing workshop with Sheila O'Connor. You may know her from the MFA program at Hamlin. And we had a conference with her and she suggested I needed to add a lumberjack point of view to balance out the book because otherwise it would have been just um, the women's point of view, which was the women were very uh, minor in the logging business. So, so I had to take it all apart and add this male point of view. Okay. And I'm glad I did but it took a lot of writing and rewriting. Yeah. And then after um, the first um, publisher went under and I got my manuscript back, I revised it again. And then one more time, I revised it again. And it's a much better book than it would have been had it been published with that first publisher. Well, it's definitely a long process that I, I don't think readers can really comprehend until you actually have to go through it yourself. Right. Um, you talked about your, your work as a nurse and, and then, you know, you're talking about when you first decided, when you wrote your first novel, I think you said your son was 20 or so. So this was kind of a secondary career for your second career. Um, but you've accomplished quite a lot in this second career. Um, can you talk about the, the process of learning to become a writer and maybe some advice you have for others that that are thinking about, you know, quitting their job and writing a novel, but not sure if they can do it. Well, actually, I didn't quit my job to write a novel. I wrote three books working full time. Um, it just takes persistence. I grew up on a dairy farm and I watched my parents milk those cows twice a day, 365 days a year. Um, I learned a good ethic from them. And that's what you have to do with writing. You have to just keep at it. And a little bit every day, and you do accomplish a lot in the end times. But I am a lazy writer. It's hard for me to keep doing it. But I do keep studying the craft. You know, um, no one would expect a little kid to take one summer's worth of piano lessons and then be um, slated to play a recital at Carnegie Hall. But it seems like many people 
expect the writing process to be sitting down, writing it next step to Oprah's couch. Um, they don't realize that it's a craft that has to be learned and it has to be really diligently pursued and crafted. My writing gets better with every book, thankfully. Um, I think most people's writing gets better sure. if they're studying it. Well, and now you're teaching it. I saw you, you're teaching a workshop called Pencil to Paper. What, what is that about? Well, um, my sister, Angela Foster, um, taught memoir at the Loft Literary Center in Minneapolis. And she was asked to do a writing workshop in an outstate library. And she invited me to join her because um, she writes memoir and I write fiction. And she thought it would be fun and a good mix of for a, an all day workshop to, you know, present on both topics. Well, um, she took a little change in her plans and is no longer teaching writing at this point. And we kept getting the invitations. So I started doing them alone. And so um, I've done quite a few writing workshops at different libraries in different places. But during COVID, um, I decided to do some online Zoom classes because everyone was looking for something to do. Um, people were stuck at home and it was just a really good time to focus in. So um, we started the pencil to paper um, classes through Blue Cottage Agency in Brainerd. And we had people from Germany, Hawaii, all over the country. It was just wonderful. And so this will be my third year of doing it again in January. And we study the basic craft of writing, um, character development, setting, descriptions, story arc, point of view, just all the basics and um, hone our skills in a very interactive, fun workshops. So if anyone's interested, check with Blue Cottage Agency and um, you can sign up there. And Blue Cottage, is that a, a publicity firm or is it something broader than that? What exactly do they do? Um, Blue Cottage um, started at a book club with me. Um, I had my first book. I had no clue what to do with it. My little publisher didn't do a lot of marketing. Um, so here I held a book and I was invited to our former babysitter's book club. She had done some babysitting for us when we had little kids. And so I went to this book club and shared Abercrombie Trail and my writing process and happened to mention that my next book was coming out. And a young woman there um, said, well, what would it take for more people to read your books? And I said, I don't know. I don't know what to do. You know, I'm living in Pequot Lakes. There's not a lot of literary activity here. I didn't know what to do. And she called me up later and said, well, let me work with you. I have a degree in marketing. And so out of that humble beginning, she started this agency where she um, does marketing, book launches, individual consults, social media, helping writers get their work noticed. And it's been a very um, fulfilling relationship through the years. So yeah, that's my relationship with her. That's interesting. I mean, I knew you worked with Blue Cottage. I didn't know the, the origins of it, but I think that's really great. Yeah. So are you ready to start on something new? Do you have something, uh, ideas in your head or what are you working on next? I'm about half done with another novel. Because as I told you, um, this one is Sister Lumberjack has been in the works for so long, mm -hmm. you know, so I've been working on another one. Um, and it's about um, a midwife in a prairie community based on a real person that my um, great grandmother knew, um, fictionalized, of course, but an, a midwife who delivered my great uncles and my grandmother. Nice. And um, very interesting personality. And so I've used her, the real person, and I write um, 
historical fiction about a little prairie town. Sounds like you're able to find a lot of unique stories just from your own family background. Yes. Who knew they would be helpful? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Candace, thank you so much for joining me and congratulations on your new novel, Sister Lumberjack. Yes, it comes out on March 7th, well, March 18th, I believe. We're having a book launch in Brainerd on St. Patrick's Day to celebrate. Mm -hmm.